As the title suggests, in this video series, we'll be solving a problem that is truly, practically useless. But it happens to be a nice example of the type of problem that quantum computers are really good at. And, in fact, the quantum computing techniques for solving this problem are actually the same as the ones that will be used to break all of modern cryptography once we build good enough quantum computers. The problem in question is about a function called mystery toggles, which operates on four bits, boolean values called x1, x2, x3, and answer. The code is as follows. If x1 equals 1, then toggle answer. If x2 equals 1, then toggle answer. And if x3 equals 1, then toggle answer. Except there's a bit of a catch. Some or all of the lines of code may be missing. More specifically, any subset of them may be missing, so any of these versions of mystery toggles are also possible. In total, there are eight possible versions, which we can represent by each of the eight subsets from the set with x1, x2, and x3. We are given one of these versions of mystery toggles, and it is our task to determine which one we are dealing with, using as few calls to mystery toggles as possible. You can think of mystery toggles as a sort of black box, where we can run it on some input, but we can't look inside to see exactly what it is doing. One thing you might try is to start with all zeros and toggle, for example, x1. Then suppose we call mystery toggles and answer is 1. This tells us that the line for x1 is present since answer got toggled. That eliminates these possibilities, and note that we can ignore the first three bits of the output since they don't change when we call mystery toggles. To proceed with our plan, let's try toggling x2 this time. Suppose we call mystery toggles now, and we see a 0. Then, we know the line for x2 is missing since answer was not toggled. We can repeat the same process until we are left with just one option. We called mystery toggles three times. We are trying to solve the problem using mystery toggles as few times as possible, though, so the question arises, can we do better? Spoiler alert, the answer is unfortunately for us, no. But you may have noticed that we could have toggled multiple bits before calling mystery toggles. With the information you see on screen now, we would know that exactly one of the lines for x1 and x2 are present, since answer must have been toggled exactly once. To prove we can't do any better, it's natural to think about a question like, what information do we get from a call to mystery toggles? But even better is the question, how much information do we get from a call to mystery toggles? And as we saw a moment ago, the answer is actually always one bit of information, the answer bit. Now suppose that there is an algorithm which correctly decides which out of the eight possibilities is the true mystery toggles, with only two calls to mystery toggles. In that case, we would get a pair of answer bits, b1 and b2, as the output of mystery toggles for those two calls. There are four possibilities for what those two bits could be, 00, 0, 01, 10, one, and 11. One, but there are eight possibilities for mystery toggles. So, without even knowing how the algorithm works, we can conclude that any algorithm that decides which out of these eight possibilities to output based only on looking at these two bits of information is wrong, since there is simply no way to match up each one of the four outputs with the eight possibilities for mystery toggles without leaving four of those possibilities unaccounted for. We just don't have enough information here. Amazingly though, with the power of quantum computation, there is a way to determine which of the eight possibilities is the true mystery toggles with just one call to mystery toggles, and it uses this special Hadamard instruction you see on the screen here. In reality, this algorithm still only needs just one call to mystery toggles no matter how many x's there are. Look how this program ends up outputting a string of bits where x2 and x3 are toggled, corresponding to the version of mystery toggles where the line for x1 is missing and the lines for x2 and x3 are both present. In order to understand how this quantum mystery toggles detective works, we'll first need to understand the basic data type of quantum computation, the quantum bit or qubit. A qubit, like a classical bit, can take values of 0 and 1. This angled bracket notation is used to represent the quantum states of 0 and 1. We'll call these basic states. What makes a qubit special is that it can exist in what is called a superposition of its basic states, which is a sort of in-between state. Specifically, each of the basic states has some number called an amplitude associated with it. 
Here, the amplitude on 0 is 0.8, and the amplitude on 1 is 0.6. As a short aside, I'll briefly mention that while it's not in the scope of this video, there are many possible ways to physically construct qubits, and this is a whole area of discussion for quantum physicists and the people building quantum computers. If you want to learn more about that, I'd recommend watching this video by Veritasium. But in theory, we can abstract the implementation of a qubit and just work with its mathematical properties. The final step in most quantum algorithms is usually to extract the qubits, or convert them into classical bits. To extract a qubit is to observe or measure it. When a qubit is measured, its state is said to collapse to one of its basic states. That is, a measurement of a qubit will either read 0 or 1, and the superposition will be destroyed. Where the amplitudes come into play is the bizarre and amazing fact of nature that the probability that this measurement reads a zero is equal to the square of the amplitude on the basic state zero, and the probability that it reads a one is equal to the square of the amplitude on the basic state one. This is a weird and inexplicable reality that we'll just have to be okay with. The very act of measuring is what causes the qubit to collapse. So in this example, if we were to measure this qubit in many parallel universes, we would expect to see 0 in about 64% of them, and 1 in the remaining 36% of them. A rule about amplitudes that should seem natural given this phenomenon is that the sum of the squares of the amplitudes must always equal 1, thereby ensuring a valid probability distribution for measurement. The amplitudes can be negative too, so if instead of plus 0.6 the amplitude on 1 is minus 0.6, that would also be a valid quantum state, since 0.8 squared plus negative 0.6 squared equals 1. The fact that amplitudes can be negative turns out to be the defining characteristic of quantum computation. In fact, in nature these amplitudes can also have complex numbered values. But specifically for the purposes of quantum computation, this truth mostly exists in theory. There aren't really any quantum algorithms that use complex amplitudes. With n qubits in the picture, then just like with classical bits, there are two to the n possible measurements of the qubits, and these measurements are the basic states. For example, if n equals 2, the basic states would be given by all possible 2-bit combinations. There is some amplitude on each of these basic states, where again, the sum of the squares of the amplitudes is 1. So in this example, the probability of measuring 0, 0 is 0.36 squared, the probability of measuring 0, 1 is 0, the probability of measuring 1 0 is minus 0.48 squared, and the probability of measuring 1 1 is 0.8 squared. Note here that while it may be instinctual to think this, it is not the case that each qubit on its own has an amplitude on 0 and an amplitude on 1. Together, the qubits jointly have an amplitude on each of their 2 to the n basic states. This is what is known as quantum entanglement. In the next video, we'll see how we can take advantage of quantum entanglement with quantum programming, and eventually we'll be able to use that knowledge to revisit and solve mystery toggles. So if you enjoyed this video, I hope to see you there!